over the past year and a half, we have looked at 114 stories <laughs> from the Old Testament. I had originally intended to do 10. <laughs> I still have nine of those 10 that I have not done. <laughs> so we'll come back at some point to great stories from the Old Testament, but I decided it's time to go to the New Testament. You have to spend time in the New Testament, specifically the epistles. And that's because that's where we get our doctrine. We find illustrations of doctrine in those Old Testament stories. We find illustrations of doctrine even in the Gospels or in the book of Acts. But if we want specific, outlined doctrine, we go to the New Testament epistles. That's why they were written. So if there's any ambiguity between stories or accounts in the book of Acts, you go to the epistles, and what the epistle says, that's the way it is. So I want to begin a series on the book of 1 John obviously written by the Apostle John, and he had two brothers, 2 John and 3 John. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just to be clear, he had a brother named James, and 2 and 3 John were two of the other epistles that he wrote. There are many things very interesting about the book of 1 John. You know that it's the only book where we find the official definition of love? Isn't that odd? The word love in its different forms, agape, phileo, storge, we find all those words for love. And it's never clearly defined except in one place, and that's the book of First John. And because of that, we have wrong ideas about love because we don't go to the definition. Only in First John. Also in First John, we find a unique gospel presentation. If you were praying for someone, or even talking to someone about their salvation. Where would you begin? Wouldn't you begin with you're a sinner? You, you can't save yourself. Uh, but Jesus Christ was willing to take all your sins upon himself. In his actual body. And when he went on the cross, he died for your sins. He paid the full penalty for your sins. They're all erased. All you have to do is trust in him as Savior. And wouldn't we start something that way? That's not how John started. He presents the gospel in a way I never would have thought of, and we're going to see that today. But the main thing about the book of 1 John, if we were to summarize 1 John, we have to say it's a series of contrasts, extreme contrasts. And John is the apostle of either or. There are no gray areas in John's world. And even his style has contrast to it. The style of the writing of 1 John, and to a degree, 2 and 3 John. There's no book that has a writing style like this. It's incredibly elementary. I mean, it's like elementary school Greek. It's like third grade writing. Very short sentences, very simple words, but amazingly, with those simple words and expressions, it's John who expresses the loftiest thoughts of anybody in the New Testament. He gets into not this world, but the cosmos, the nature of God, the nature of man, using elementary school words. So when you read 1 John, it's the simple little expressions. To me, they're like a, a drumbeat. You read the expressions, the next one comes along, and you get this sense of comfort and peace, and there's a little peaceful rhythm to it. And then he'll wow you. So it'd be like reading something like this. See Dick, see Jane, see Sally, see Spot Run, see God become a man. Whoa! <laughs> That's the way it is to read First John. The comfortable rhythm conveys these powerful messages. But the key word for me has to be contrasts. Simple language, powerful thoughts, New ways of thinking, as I said, a new definition of love. And it's either or, either or. And that's John's world. Either or. Let me give you some examples. First John 2, 22. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Now, there is typical John right there. We would say, these people have rejected Jesus. They have been misguided. 
They misunderstand, and we should pray for them. John says they're liars. <laughs> That's what John is. John calls people liars <laughs> without apology. And he defines who the liars are. Yes, who is a liar? The one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. There we go. The one who denies the Father and the Son. Now, that's Antichrist with a small a correctly, because as I pointed out on Europe One this week, there is a movement of Antichrist, which basically is the whole world. But there's going to be a person, the Antichrist, who will certainly be the opposite of Jesus Christ. And so, typical contrast here between Antichrist and Jesus Christ. You see that? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist. That's typical John style. Very simple words. And you know what's the advantage of very simple words and sentences? Is that you see the contrast vividly. So here's the contrast between Jesus Christ and Antichrist. Now we see a lot of contrast in that one verse. Antichrist. Obviously, he's talking about people who are in the truth and people who are in falsehood, right? Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Throughout the book of First John, we see liars and people who are in the truth. And I want to point out, there's no middle ground with John. It's either or. There's no middle ground. There are no gray areas. You're living a lie or you're in the truth. Or I guess he would say, you're telling the truth or you're a liar. And I tell you, John did not hesitate to just say, they're liars, either or. And again, as I said, a clear contrast between Jesus Christ and Antichrist. And again, yes, he's obviously talking about two specific people, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Son of God, and the Antichrist who will come at the end of the age. But what's really important is that he's talking about two groups of people also. It's not just Jesus and Antichrist, two people. He's talking about two groups of people. And again, it's either or. If you have trusted in Jesus as Savior at one point in your life, then you are with Jesus Christ. And here's what's shocking. If you have never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, and you can't identify the moment when you trusted in him as Savior, you are actually part of Antichrist. And there's nothing in between. Isn't that amazing? See, I tend to put a third category I tend to think there's believers, unbelievers, and moral unbelievers. You ever do that? They can just well-meaning people out there who have not trusted in Jesus as Savior, but they're morally good people. John would say, they're liars. John would say, I don't care if they're good people or not. If they've never trusted in Jesus as Savior, they are antichrist. So people listening, which are you? You're either with Jesus or you're with antichrist. I've got to ask this question. In that, in that statement, who is a liar, but who denies that Jesus? Are they saying that people, is John saying that people know the truth really inside of them, but they're still denying it? And why does he say the liar who denies I'll develop that as we go through there, because that's a very common thing in the book of John. And we say, well, did he not grant that they didn't understand? You know, we tend to do that. But I'll answer your question quickly, and that is, yes, he assumes that deep down they do know. And that's why it's either or, no gray area and no shadows. If you trusted in Jesus as Savior, you're on the team of Jesus Christ. If you have never done that, I don't care what kind of person you are, you're on the group of Antichrist. Nothing in between. And again, liars and not liars. That's John's world. There's a realm of truth, and there's a realm of falsehood. 1 John 2.21, he says, no lie is of the truth. It's, a, it's an interesting expression, which I'll develop when we get there. But really, you see what it means clearly, that there's no middle ground. If you can't have a body that has a little bit of lie and extra hate the truth out of it. Boy, isn't that the problem we have in this culture today? There's no clear delineation between right and wrong, truth or falsehood. Boy, when John was here, he would say, you're a liar, you're not a liar. You're a liar, you're not a liar. And by the way, the liars are on the Antichrist side. Well, wouldn't you love to have John around here today? That's what he'd be saying. So you see, that's John's world. Are you in the truth or are you of the lie? So now, people who claim that they are religious and people who claim they're Christians, let's think about that. There are a lot of people around the world who claim they're Christians. John would say, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior at a moment in your life? And if they haven't, John would say, 
they're liars. John could actually come across as being hard-hearted. He wasn't really, but he could give that impression. There are times in the epistle when he even tells us that there are some people that we shouldn't even pray for. He says, don't even pray for them. Just let them go to hell. <laughs> and with his temperament, which I'll show you in a few minutes here, it's almost as if he's saying, let them go to hell and preferably let lightning strike them before they go to hell. <laughs> that was John. I've always had an impression of John as being, what's the word? Yep. Sissy. <laughs> love, 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 dude. <laughs> all you need is love. That's the picture I got of John. He wasn't that way at all. He was rough, and he could be brutal. Well, that's why Jesus called him. He was one of the sons of thunder. Yep, that's where I'm going just here. <laughs> so, First John, it's either or. You're either with Jesus Christ or you're with Antichrist. No middle ground, no morally good ground. You're with Jesus or you're with Antichrist. And there's truth or there's falsehood. There's no middle ground there. There's no little bit of truth. And there's light and dark and no shadows. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. See again? Either or. You're either in the light or you're in the dark. There's no gray area. There's no shadows to hide in. Now, what is light? I'll give you a quick definition. It's revelation. It's knowledge. But specifically in the Bible, light means specific knowledge of the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus' atoning death on that cross for those of us who would trust in him for salvation. That's light. Now, what's dark? Anything that's not that. You don't have to be a Satan worshiper. You can be a good church person. If you have never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're in the darkness. There's no middle ground. It's either or. Is that why light is capitalized? It is like a... I didn't even notice that light was capitalized. I mean, it is in mine, but... Yeah, it is in mine. I wouldn't have capitalized it. Okay. I don't see any need to. Light, dark, <laughs> truth. Falsehood. And I think this is something we Christians tend to be mistaken about. If someone says he's a Christian, say he's part of a church that professes to be Christian, and they have a big cross on the front, and they teach about Jesus. If a person has been in that church, but has never trusted in Jesus as Savior, do we realize that person is he's just as far from God as an atheist? Religious people are not closer to God than heathen. Maybe further away. In some way, but the main thing is it's light or dark. It's truth or falsehood. It's Jesus Christ or Antichrist. No middle ground. And a religious person is no closer to God than an atheist without the cross. Light or dark. <laughs> See what I mean? That's the whole book. Either or. Jesus Christ, Antichrist. Truth, lie. Light, darkness. And another contrast he's going to make, judgment and no judgment. There is no middle ground. Oh, that's where we really get off, mm -hmm. on the area of judgment. We put a middle ground in there, don't we? We say, I know I won't be judged in the sense of going to hell, but God will discipline me and chastise me and chasten me and punish me. There's a middle ground in there. That's darkness. You're either judged or you're not. Who's not judged? Those who have trusted in Jesus, they're on the side of Jesus. They are in the light. They're not in the darkness. There's no middle ground. They're not judged. It's as simple as that. Now, a person who has never trusted in Jesus as Savior, he basically judges himself during this life, and he'll be judged by eternal separation from God for all eternity. So you're either judged to the full extent, including at eternity in hell, or your judgment doesn't even touch you. You see, it's either or. That's why First John is such a valuable book. It clearly defines either or and doesn't leave room for gray areas. Now, with that understanding that John was strong, he was very decisive, he, he could somewhat be brutal. 
With that in mind, there's something very unusual about the book of 1 John. And that is this. It's a very short epistle. It only has five chapters. But you know that the word love appears 46 times? I counted it twice. I was going to count it a third time, but I got a headache. <laughs> Actually, I got this little program that will count for me. <laughs> 46 times the word love from this guy. One of the guys says, you don't believe in Jesus, you're a liar, you're in darkness, go to hell. Matter of fact, if you just scan through the book of 1 John, all you see is love, 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 and really you don't have much interest in reading it because you're thinking this is going to be kind of mushy. <laughs> and it's easy to picture John walking around, oh, love, man, and calling everybody dude. <laughs> dude, man, love, peace out, bro. <laughs> Actually, John has a definition of love we've probably never thought of. And that's why he can be the apostle of love, but not in the way we think of. And as I said, he's going to define love for us, and I hope we never forget what it means, because it's a way we would never intuitively think. We've all heard about agape love. That's the love that is not feelings-based, but actions, uh, treating other people for their benefit, seeking the welfare of of the one who is loved. That's agape love. Well, John carries it a step further, which I'll show you here in a minute. But back to John. He's either or. No gray areas. And actually, I decided that it would be a great benefit if we want to understand the book of 1 John, especially this odd interplay between a guy who's tough, who's harsh, who's rigid, and love, love, love. And we have to understand at least a few highlights of his life. So I want to review some of the things about John's life, specifically with the purpose of understanding how we have this tension between this very elementary language, powerful thoughts, and either or, light or dark, and no room for middle ground. John, probably when he was a teenager, started following John the Baptist along with John's brother, James. Now, there's another James in the Bible. That's the brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. This is the apostle James, who is the brother of John. Both of them were followers of John the Baptist. But as they followed John the Baptist, they also maintained their fishing business at Capernaum, apparently along with Peter and his brother Andrew. And they appeared to be pretty well off because we know that John... The apostle's mother was named Salome, and she financed Jesus' ministry. So they, they were kind of an upper middle class. One day they were with John the Baptist, and something happened, and John's whole world changed. John one twenty nine. the next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the word actually hauls it off. <laughs> and now we go to Mark. Jesus now is starting his ministry, and as he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw James, the son of Zebedee. And remember Zebedee? That was his first name. Remember what his last name was? Dudah. Dudah, yes. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. There's our apostle John right there, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went away to follow him. And John would follow Jesus for the next three and a half years. John and his brother James were what we would call characters. I see pictures of the apostles, and they look like a bunch of sissies. I like the one with the glowing hearts in their chest. <laughs> Those are my favorites. <laughs> Let me give you one example from the life of John and James. Mark 3, 17. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. So he's saying Jesus nicknamed John and James sons of thunder. That doesn't sound like a couple of sissies to me. Actually, what's interesting is that Jesus did not say, hey, you guys are flower children. 
they were sons of thunder, and with good reason. Let me show you why he said they're sons of thunder. And this incident shapes John's way of thinking, either or. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus is beginning the long journey down to Jerusalem to go to the cross. And they have to go through Samaria, so Jesus always sent people ahead to make arrangements for their travels. Luke 9, 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. By the way, I love Luke's thinking. He didn't say when the days were approaching for him to go to the cross. He said when the days were approaching for his ascension, he's already looking past. He's already looking through that because he survived that crucifixion. And he sent messengers ahead of him. And they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. Luke is being somewhat gracious here. They didn't accept him because he was a Jew. They said, we don't serve your kind around here. <laughs> so now <laughs> they can't make arrangements to go through Samaria. So Luke 9, 54, his disciples, James and John, saw this. They saw that, hey, no Jews allowed. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> <laughs> they were totally serious. They were not joking. But I got to tell you, I like the way they think. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Let's just burn the whole place down, right? <laughs> now, do you see why Jesus said, man, you guys are sons of thunder. <laughs> you guys are thunderbirds. <laughs> well, actually... What we just saw there with John, he retained a lot of that thinking. And that's why it's manifest in the book of 1 John. That was the way he thought. He said, I'm not going to worry about them. Let them go to hell, and preferably God will strike them down now so I can watch it. <laughs> now, as he got older, he developed a little bit of compassion. But that fiery nature and that either-or disposition never left him. And also the part about people who were in the darkness, had heard the truth and rejected it, he had zero sympathy for them. Absolutely. He said, don't even pray for them. This is a man who had the gift of prophecy, just speaking forth the truth and saw things in black and white, wouldn't you think? Yes, he had a great gift of prophecy, and that meaning not the ability to tell the future, which he could do, but he could make great discernment. You know what? It takes a lot of discernment to recognize people who you stop praying for. Now, that takes some great discernment. But he had groups of people where he said, don't pray for them. Shake the dust in their sandals. Move on. Shake the dust in the sandals and hope that, <laughs> that God would send down lightning. And what I love is they thought they could do that. <laughs> Isn't that great? He didn't say, Jesus, why don't you? He said, hey, you want us to? Could they do that? Um, maybe they could because he called them together and gave them supernatural powers, cast out demons, do supernatural things. So maybe they could. I'm just glad they asked permission. <laughs> they would have been dangerous. By the way, I think this shows Jesus' sense of humor. Thunder boys. He didn't rebuke them. He just called them thunder boys didn't say, you boys need to soften down, <laughs> be a little more gentle. You're sons of thunder. No middle ground. You're either in Jesus Christ group, Antichrist group, you're in light, you're in darkness, you're the truth, you're the lie, you're judged or you're not judged. That's it. Now, let me give you another episode in the life of James and John. Matthew 20, they're in the shadow of the cross. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee, that's Salome, the one who financed the ministry, came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request. She's thinking, I'm giving some cash. I deserve some help. I need a favor. S-A-L-O-M-E. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. He said to them, my cup you will drink, you will die. But to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my Father. Now, what's interesting is that the 12 apostles will have a special place in heaven. They just didn't know it. Hearing this, the 10 became indignant with the two brothers. Now, the reason that verse intrigues me is they didn't get indignant with their mother. 
They got indignant with them, meaning they must have been lording it over everybody. Hey, we can pull down fire, you can't. Mm -hmm. It's either or. You're either with us or against us. I can see them. They were brash. I think this either or disposition, we are and you're not. <laughs> but John became a very powerful apostle. And he was able to combine the strong contrast with the concept of love. And it's love that transformed John into a great, powerful apostle. He was transformed by love. But as I said, we have to understand what John means by love. And before we get to the formal definition, let me show you from the Gospel of John that before he wrote 1 John, he got it. He understood what love is. What we want to see is through the Gospel of John, of course, that he wrote, how he identified himself. John always identified himself the same way. It's a way we never would have thought of. At the Last Supper, John 13, 23, John makes reference to one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. You know who that disciple is? It's himself. It's John. That's what he called himself. He didn't refer to himself as me or my. It's the disciple that Jesus loved. At the empty tomb, John chapter 20, verse 2. So she, that's Mary Magdalene, she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how he always identifies himself. John 21, they're at the Sea of Galilee after Jesus has resurrected. And they see a man on the shore. They don't know who he is. Finally, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. Every time, the disciple that Jesus loved. John 21, 20, same scene. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. This happens all throughout the book of John. That's how he identified himself. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. And notice he never says, I'm the one who loved Jesus. It's always, I'm the one that Jesus loved. And see, that's all that John knew he could cling to. He knew his love for Jesus would come and go, vary, and with time it would fade. But he knew that Jesus' love for him would never fade. And that's what John means by love. Whenever we see love all through this book, we don't ever want to think that it's ourselves loving God. It's just the opposite. And here's the formal definition of love. 1 John 4.10. It's translated, in this is love. I think some verses have, herein is love. I don't like that because if you have that language, it sounds like that John is describing love. And he's not describing love. He's defining love. The big difference. In this is love would mean Here's what love is like. This is love means this is what love is. And in fact, the sentence begins with the word estin, E-S-T-I-N. It just means is. So literally, the sentence starts with is. In fact, literally, it says is love. Now, what does is love mean? Well, it depends on what you mean by is. <laughs> in the Greek language, whenever you begin a sentence with the verb is, you know what that means? Formal definition is to follow. So what is love? Is it warm, mushy feelings? No. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation literally is the mercy seat for our sins. I like to think of propitiation as absorption, where he absorbed all of our sins. He absorbed all of the punishment that was due us. But what a startling definition that is of love. Whenever the Bible uses the word love and tells us that we are to love, we need to never forget the definition of love. Even those passages that say we are to love God with all of our heart, even that one, we look at that and say, I'm to love God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, all that. The reason I say all that is that we can't do any of all that. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind. All your, there's no possible way. But if we keep in mind, John said the word love means he loved us. 
So it's a startling concept, isn't it? And it's hard to reconcile. So what do we do with the direct statement? You should love the Lord your God. John says, this is love, not that we loved him. Almost seemed like a contradiction, doesn't it? We're to love him, and John says, no, love is that he loved us. And he doesn't just say that love is that God loved us. He says specifically not, not that we love God. He went out of his way to say that. So what do we do with the commandment? You should love the Lord with all your heart. We say, I can't, but I know you love me. That's what John did. John rested his whole life knowing that he could not love him, but that God loved him. Once again, it gets the focus off itself. It's exactly what it does. It takes the focus off ourselves. Because people who say, well, I'm going to focus on loving the Lord and loving my neighbor as myself. Well, that's very self-righteous and totally self-centered. The definition of love is not that I love him, but that he loves me. Now, the result of that does not produce a soft person. See, I think if we go overboard to love him, love everybody with our own strength, that makes us soft. Love that comes totally from God makes us strong. And so you see, it's that love that John felt from Jesus that enabled him to be a strong person. And to point out light, dark, heaven or hell, Jesus, Antichrist. He was one of the closest. He was in the inner circle, the inner circle of, of about three of the disciples. He and Jesus were very close. And he's the only one of the apostles who was there at the cross. Standing there with Jesus' mother, Mary. And what a scene. John 19, 26. When Jesus then saw his mother... <laughs> And who else? And the disciple whom he loved, he never changes. Standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. By the way, whenever we see that woman, Jesus calling people woman, it sounds like a woman. <laughs> you and the pilgrim. <laughs> sounds rude. He's always calling people woman. That is literally the word. But it had a respectful meaning it would be more like saying ma'am behold your son obviously john then he said to the disciple behold your mother from that hour the disciple took her into his own household yes he did and we know from polycarp polycarp is a disciple of the apostle john who wrote many many things about john that we know about his life he says that he took mary to ephesus and they moved there and Polycarp pointed something out that's very interesting to me. Polycarp said that the disciple whom Jesus loved <laughs> told him that God took away all the memories of the cross out of Mary's mind. So she had total black, didn't remember anything about the cross whatsoever. You know, because that would be a, something you would never, ever get over to watch such a heinous thing. So Polycarp said God removed that from her mind. Now, John lived a long, long time. Peter and Paul died about 67 A.D., whereas John died about 100 A.D. So just think, for over 30 years, he was the only apostle. He outlived them by 30-something years. And because John lived such a long life, he had many followers who wrote about him. And therefore... We know more about the life of John than any other apostle. It's astonishing how much we know about his life because he had so many followers who wrote about him. And Polycarp tells some great stories about John. John, the one you know we call the apostle of love, he said they were traveling through Turkey, or they called it Asia, and they had someone come run to them and say, hey, you better turn around and go back. Right around this rocky bend, there's a gang of thieves there. They got knives. They're ready to kill you and rob you. So the party stands there, and John calmly walks out. Where are you going? Cool it, cool it, in Greek. <laughs> he comes around the bend. They're afraid to move. About an hour later, here comes John with the whole band, and they've all been saved. And nobody knows what happened. <laughs> the emperor in John's later life was Domitian. 
He was wretched. He hated Christianity. He hated Christ. He was definitely darkness. He was definitely antichrist. And he tried to kill John in sadistic ways. Polycarp says that he put John into a pot of boiling oil. Yes, and the oil started boiling. And John stayed in the vat and asked if they could make it hotter because it was wonderful for his bones. <laughs> so that ticked off the emperor. So he gave him poison to drink. John drank it, asked for more, and said it was very refreshing. <laughs> Finally, Domitian exiled him to the island of Patmos. He said, I'll show him. Oh, John couldn't have been happier. A beautiful island full of food. And that's where he wrote the gospel, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, about the year 95 to 100. Now, Domitian, the emperor, I'm sure John was not praying for his welfare. You know, <laughs> John, I think, would be the kind who would say, don't pray for him, take him out. And I think John was praying that for Domitian, <laughs> not for his welfare. Let him go to hell, and please, a lightning bolt now. Domitian was always paranoid. He was telling people, they're out to kill me. People are out to kill me. They're out to get me. His advisor said, no, 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 your emperor. The emperor, they're not out to get you. You don't have enemies. There's no reason to be paranoid. <laughs> As he was being stabbed to death, his last words were, told you so, I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> he was replaced by Nerva, N-E-R-V-A, an excellent emperor. He gave John his freedom. He said, you can stay where you want. You can go wherever you want. He went back to Ephesus, and he's the only apostle to have died of natural causes. Although I understand, very recently, his death certificate was revised to say he died of coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so for 30 years, think about it, he's the only apostle. And John waited several years before he started writing. And you know what the advantage is? Over those 30 years, John had the advantage of understanding the essentials even more than Paul had. John grasped even to an extent greater than Paul that all that mattered was the relationship. Not trying to obey, just the relationship. And John realized that the relationship was all Jesus is doing. That he could not fall out of fellowship. And John learned that's really all that matters is that relationship. And because of that, we find the message of grace more fully developed in John than all the others. He had 30 more years to live it. John's understanding of the relationship, and it was one-sided. It's all Jesus' love, not dependent on my love, not dependent on my feelings or my faithfulness. He's always steady. He always loves me. That's relationship. That even impacted John's gospel presentation. As I said, we would tend to say you're a sinner, you need Christ, and maybe that, that's probably the right way to start. That's not the way John started his gospel. How do you think he would start it? 1 John 1, 3, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us. Yes, twice that word is translated fellowship. I don't really have a problem with the word fellowship, except for the fact that it's a word we don't use. Do we? We don't use the word fellowship except in religious contexts. I'm going to go fellowship with the guys and watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> what? Yeah, uh, we got a dear lease. We're going to go fellowship out there. The Greek word is koinonia. And there was a time when you always knew it was a Bible church because they had koinonia written somewhere. Also, you'd know it was a Bible church because the worship service would consist of singing praise songs with the same verse 27 times. <laughs> and that's fellowship. If we understand the word fellowship as relationship, some of these verses will make a lot more sense to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have a relationship with us. That's him and the other believers. And indeed, our relationship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. He said, that's what we proclaim to you. Isn't that interesting? He's proclaiming the gospel. But he begins the gospel presentation with, we want you to have a relationship with us. 
What a great way to present the gospel to an unsaved person. He says, do you want a relationship with Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that be an interesting way to start? Instead of saying, here's how to go to heaven, here's how to not go to hell, say, do you want a relationship with Jesus Christ right now? And the beauty of that approach is if someone who has a relationship right now with Jesus Christ, <clears throat> through trusting in him as Savior, he has a relationship now, and then by definition, that relationship continues on through eternity. So relationship was so important to John, that was his gospel presentation. Okay, so that's the book of 1 John. I hope that will clarify things and make it more enjoyable. It's a lot of either ors. And so, therefore, a religious person has never gone to the cross, has never made that one-time decision to trust in Jesus as Savior. He is just as in the dark as some pagan. On the other hand, someone who does trust in Jesus as Savior, he has a relationship with Jesus right now, which continues on, and he's in the light. He's never in the dark. He's never judged. And we can say, my identity is somebody who Jesus loves. Right. How we would think differently, we said, what is your identity? We all look for our identity. People are trying to find themselves. You know what? It may be pretty simple to say, who are you? I'm the one that Jesus loves. And I'll tell you what will happen. Supernaturally, we'll start to love him back. Anybody have any questions? Tell by look from afar that a person was a Jew coming into town? Or did they have to speak? Good question. Could the Samaritans tell by looking if somebody coming into town was Jewish? They had to hear them speak is the answer. And when they spoke, it was extremely obvious. Connie? I think it's interesting that the three men that, that we all think of as in the, Jesus' is inner circle, John, James, and Peter, they were all very strong prophets and strong personalities. They were all leaders. But I think it's interesting when you were talking about uh, Matthew 20, when Salome was you know, asking Jesus to make her sons in prominent positions, said the ten became indignant with the two brothers. That included Peter. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, who, who left and made you God? <laughs> and you know he's the one that called them out. <laughs> yes, yes. You're right. The inner circle, not one sissy in the whole group. There were tough, tough ones. Father, we thank you for this Book of 1 John, that written by your disciple that you loved. We thank you actually that you wrote this book through the power of your Holy Spirit and it's addressed to us. Father, we thank you that in this world of either ors that you have placed us in the right group. Through no doing of our own, you took us out of the realm of darkness and put us into the realm of light. You're the one who removed us from the realm of judgment and put us into your world of peace and relationship. All because of that one moment when we trusted in Jesus as our Savior. We thank you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.